26, 2010 started out like any other day. My husband Nathan and I got up early, fed our toddler his breakfast, and had our family devotional time. I was 31 weeks pregnant with our second child. As I stood to my feet following prayer, I instantly sensed something was wrong. The problem soon became obvious. My waters had broken. In the moments that followed, we rushed about in panic mode, phoning the midwife, arranging to leave our son with a friend, and then racing to the local hospital. As we drove, I wondered what this day would bring. Would our child survive? Would she be normal? How would we explain things to our son? At the hospital, time passed in a daze. The CTG machine droned on and on, monitoring my contractions and the baby's heart rate. Medical personnel streamed in and out of my room to give an injection, take a sample, or just to remind me to stay calm. The Royal Flying Doctors were called to transfer me to Adelaide in hopes of keeping the baby inside as long as possible. Just as they were about to land, I started bleeding. One look at my doctor's face said it all. There was no time to lose. As I was wheeled into the operating theater, one of the midwives put her hand on my shoulder and reminded me again to stay calm. How do you stay calm when your world has gone pear-shaped? Days later, several people mentioned to Nathan and me that they were surprised by how calm we were under these circumstances. How did I stay calm? For me, it had nothing to do with knowing exactly what would happen around the next bend, but in knowing which direction we were headed. Which way are you headed? Where are you going? Today I'm headed for the cemetery, but I'm hoping it's only for a brief visit. So which way are you really headed? Are you going in the direction you really intended? What will you do when you get there? Benjamin Franklin popularized the phrase, nothing in life is certain except death and taxes. If he is right, one thing is certain, you and I will at some point come here. Whether we like it or not, whether we are ready or not, this is our destination. Deep down, many of us have a sense that something about death just isn't right. It might be possible to rationalize the death of an elderly person who has lived a good life and is suffering from Alzheimer's. In such a case, death seems almost like a blessing. But what about the others? The ones that haunt us in those rare quiet moments when we allow ourselves to think about them. What about the young mother who dies unexpectedly? Or the child who dies of cancer? As a follower of Jesus Christ, I see an answer for death, and it hangs on one verifiable historical event. According to Jesus' contemporaries, he claimed that he would rise from the dead on the third day after being killed. Now, it's no big deal that Jesus died 2,000 years ago, so did everybody else. But imagine if Jesus predicted his resurrection and then fulfilled it. If Jesus got out of here, could this have a bearing on what happens to you after you get here? But why would any thinking person in the 21st century want to be reviewing some supernatural event that happened 2,000 years ago? David Hume, a well-known 18th century skeptic, felt that if you had a choice between natural and supernatural explanations, one should choose the more likely natural explanation. Even if we doubt Hume's logic, there are lots of spiritual traditions that claim to be true. So why would a thinking person start with Jesus of Nazareth?
there is one crucial difference between Jesus' claims and those of other faiths. Jesus' claims are testable. Some spiritual traditions depend upon secret revelations or private interpretations. But authentic Christianity is way out in the open and has been from its inception. David Hume depends on probability to imply fact. But if we have solid evidence for an exception, his probability becomes irrelevant. It's not simply a matter of blind faith or random chance. It's about weighing the evidence. Atheist Sam Harris says that Christianity is dangerous and divisive. Jesus claims to defeat death and offer the only path to life. These claims cannot be equally valid. How can we evaluate the historicity of Jesus' resurrection? Well, let me offer two premises. If these premises are both true, Sam Harris is on shaky ground and Jesus' claims are substantiated. First, Christians exist today who believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Second, there is no plausible natural explanation for the origin of the belief in Jesus' resurrection. If these two premises can be shown to be true, then this conclusion necessarily follows. It is most probable that Jesus died, was buried, and then rose again on the third day. Now, most people wouldn't argue too much with premise one. Resurrection-believing Christians have been around for a long time. Most of us know of at least one. It's not too much of a stretch to agree that premise one is true. So Christians exist today. But is their belief based on reality or is it simply a fanciful story like Jack and the Beanstalk? Let's look at premise two. Could it be that a supernatural resurrection is the best explanation for the origin of the Christian faith? Well, what do we know about the event? Let us consider six aspects of the resurrection of Jesus, which critical scholarship can generally accept. First, Jesus Christ died by crucifixion. This is attested by Tacitus, Josephus, and possibly also Mara Basarapian's letter. Second, Jesus' followers claim that the tomb was discovered empty soon after by women. This is recorded in hundreds of authentic ancient manuscripts from at least four different traditions. Third, the disciples and apostles had experiences they believed were post-resurrection appearances. This is recorded in a letter written by the former skeptic named Saul of Tarsus to the believers in Corinth in about AD 52. Fourth, Jesus' disciples were timid men who were afraid for their lives. After Jesus' possible resurrection, they became bold and fearless proclaimers despite great persecution. Clement of Rome writes a letter to the believers in Corinth, revealing that both Peter and Paul had been executed for their faithful witness. Yet earlier, Paul had hunted Christians and Peter had denied Christ. Fifth, James, the brother of Jesus, was a skeptic who is recorded as disbelieving that Jesus was Christ the Messiah. After the death and possible resurrection of Jesus, however, he became a bold leader in the church, proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Sixth, Paul, a prominent and highly educated skeptic, who had been determined to stamp out the teaching of the resurrection, claimed to experience a public conversion. This is evidenced by Paul's own claims, as well as those of Clement of Rome. What can we make of these six historical premises? They provide a basis on which to objectively evaluate an explanation for the origin of the Christian faith. There are several alternative theories that have been suggested. Let us review them and see how they stack up with our evidence. Let's look at the original argument against the resurrection. 
This objection dates to the very event itself. Can it be sustained? The religious leaders of Jesus' day thought that perhaps the disciples might try to steal Jesus' body after his burial to fake a resurrection. Despite the best efforts of the Roman soldiers, the disciples still managed to steal the body. The stolen body theory lacks explanatory power. Both the Romans and the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus dead and specifically feared a fake resurrection. A Roman detachment was dispatched to guard Jesus' tomb. They did not want to leave any rumours to chance. Even so, let's imagine for a moment that the disciples were somehow able to get past the Roman soldiers and steal the body. Would they then be willing to go to their deaths for something they knew to be a lie? Why did new converts join the Christian faith if the soldiers could contradict the claims of the disciples? Most of the disciples ended up dying horrific deaths for their faith. Religious zealots might be willing to die for a fantasy they believe to be true, but who would die for something they know for certain is false? So how does the stolen body theory match up with our six facts? That's only two out of six. Some more creative people have proposed that Jesus actually had a twin brother. Perhaps, as this theory goes, Jesus' twin, who had managed to play a low profile throughout Jesus' miracle working ministry, appeared on the scene at precisely the right moment on Sunday morning. Must be. Remember when we went sailing on the Lake of Galilee? Huh? He convinced the grief-stricken disciples that their friend Jesus was alive. From our vantage point in the 21st century, this sounds like a reasonable idea, and it explains how people might have been deceived into believing that Jesus had risen. But if we look closer, there are several problems. It would only take a few people to pipe up and say, Hey, wait a minute guys, there is another guy who looks just like Jesus. I knew him from school days in Capernaum. Jesus' twin, of course, would not have had the same memories as the real Jesus either. Huh? And his disciples would have easily been able to tell that this was not the man they had lived and travelled with for the past three and a half years. Don't forget Jesus' other brother James, who came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. This wouldn't happen if James knew Jesus' post-death appearances were merely a twin brother in disguise. Finally, the tomb would still be occupied. That would have been an easy matter for Jesus' enemies to point out. Nevertheless, the twin theory scores four out of six. Not bad, but is this the best explanation? Ah, you say, how about the swoon theory? <laughs> Maybe Jesus didn't actually die. Perhaps the Roman executioners failed in their professional work so that it only seemed like Jesus died. He looks terrible! Jesus, are you okay? Later, in the coolness, Jesus revived and was rescued by his disciples. Yes, he's alive! Ow. Here's another case where we find major difficulties if we look at the theory more carefully. The Romans were experts at execution. The soldiers who crucified Jesus had their jobs and reputations and possibly even their lives on the line. They would have been certain to do the job properly. In addition, the Jewish leaders who insisted on Jesus' death 
were also intent on making sure he died and stayed dead. Even if Jesus really had survived crucifixion, there is no way he would be travelling extensively and surprising his followers with appearances in which he appeared fully fit. Even if the grief-stricken disciples were to fall for this, it would take just one witness in any one of several locations to quash the celebrations by saying, I saw Jesus over in Emmaus, and boy, he sure has some serious injuries. Those Roman soldiers made a mess of him. The score? Once again, four out of six. How about the hallucination theory? A more popular theory involves the idea of a big mushroom party. The grieving disciples managed to perceive all kinds of miraculous events courtesy of some fine, mind-altering stimulation. This theory might explain why the disciples would have been willing to die for their beliefs, but how well does it stack up in other ways? First, the disciples had to have the same hallucination around the same time. And then there is the issue of the empty tomb. If the disciples merely hallucinated Jesus' resurrection, where did the body end up? Maybe the believers could hallucinate seeing an empty tomb, but how about the skeptics who wanted to make sure it was occupied? Furthermore, the physical experiences, such as eating with Jesus and touching him by various individuals and groups, transcend a mental state. The disciples spoke of these events when they preached in Jerusalem a short time later, appealing to witnesses who were present in the crowd. It seems that the hallucination theory, although creative, actually creates more questions than it solves. Intellectual evidence that this is an inferior theory. The hallucination theory scores two out of six. We might be generous and grant a third point, but only if we ignore contemporary skeptics who would have undoubtedly found an occupied tomb. Okay, well, how about a conspiracy theory? This theory claims that the whole resurrection was a brilliant setup, orchestrated with great cunning, financial investment, and infiltration at all levels. This would be the ultimate conspiracy theory. Although conspiracies might sometimes be substantiated, this one also creates more difficulties than it can solve. Who would be willing to assist the disciples to simultaneously discredit the Roman justice system and the Jewish religious leadership? There were plenty of people on each side, but from the beginning, these two groups despised each other. Finally, if it was all a conspiracy, what was the motive to start a new religion? Don't forget that Christianity specifically requires generosity toward the poor, faithfulness to one's spouse, and placing others first. Certainly not the most desirable tenets for a great, new, self-centered, sex-oriented, money or fame-seeking cult. This score can only give us two out of six. Now, I can guess what you were thinking. Perhaps it is all just legendary. Perhaps it never really happened. Maybe a man named Jesus of Nazareth never even existed, and the whole story is made up. Okay, I will grant you that option. But my question remains, if Jesus didn't invent the Christian faith, then how did it come into existence? How did people come to believe in Jesus' resurrection? Let us consider a modern-day Port Augusta example. Instead of Jerusalem and Passover and Resurrection, think Port Augusta and Warfest and 
Superman. Warfest is an annual travelling show that draws large crowds of people, both locals and visitors. It is filled with sounds, sights and memories for the whole family. Imagine that a small group of Port Augusta friends claim that my brother is Superman. We know this because at Warfest, Superman jumped across the Spencer Gulf and demonstrated strength greater than the pitchy Richie steam locomotive. Now, imagine that Superman is real. Imagine hundreds of living witnesses remembering supernatural events and facing death for their recollections. Imagine that thousands more joined this group of Superman fans for no personal gain, yet convicted by the historicity of the events. Sound preposterous? Do you think you'd fall for it? Yet this is exactly what our ancient manuscripts record. Not only did Jesus' followers claim supernatural events, they made these claims within living memory and in the same city where the public events allegedly took place. This was not a teaching that engendered wealth, safety, or the respect of the authorities either. How did this teaching about Jesus' resurrection grow from nothing to become one of the largest worldwide religions? Well, that's my question. And here is my contention. Christians exist today, but there is no plausible explanation for the origin of the belief in the resurrection. Unless, of course, we concede the claims of the primary witnesses. Tell me, as a thinker, given the evidence, as a logical person, what else makes sense? So which way are you really headed? Three and a half years ago, I was headed to Adelaide on this plane. Following an emergency caesarean, my three pound, six ounce baby girl and I were on our way to a place where she could receive the finest care available. It took time, effort, and patience as she gradually learned to feed and slowly began to grow stronger. It was five weeks before we could take our little one home for the first time. What a joyful day it was when Hannah came home, a brand new life, perfectly healthy and beautiful. It makes me think of Jesus' ultimate claim. Jesus promises that one day he will make all things new. Sorrow, pain, and death will no longer exist. Babies won't die, cancer will be a thing of the past, and every story will have a happy ending like Hannah's. Jesus fulfilled his promise that he would die and rise again. He will keep this promise too. Maybe you've always thought that the Christian faith requires belief in the absence of evidence. Maybe you have hard questions about how God could allow suffering and death. Perhaps the idea of a resurrection strikes you as a way of escaping the reality of our world. Yet according to these words of the Apostle Paul, the resurrection offers no hope at all unless it is true. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still under condemnation for your sins. But the fact is that Christ has been raised from the dead. He has become the first of a great harvest of those who will be raised to life again. There's no hope in believing a lie. Only truth can offer hope. So what are the implications if it is true? It means that Jesus' claims are trustworthy. And if we can rely on his promise to die and rise again, 
we can also depend on his promise to do away with death forever. That's real hope. So what about you? Will you examine the evidence for yourself? Where are you really headed?